IFPMA launched Access Accelerated. We thank the, the 20 or more companies that are involved in this uh, very unique uh, initiative. It's unique in several ways. One, because you've got, for the first time, I think companies actually working together. They have their individual initiatives, they have new initiatives, but they're working together on a common platform, and sharing practices, ideas, experiences, and moving forward when one together. But I think it's important to note that this is a patient-focused, patient-orientated initiative. And patients are first. And as part of that, it's also empowering the patients that Access Accelerated is dealing with. One of the great things that we saw in Kenya was how we brought together uh, patients, um, or people, I think it's better to say, people living with NCDs uh, in Kenya, in a platform, and providing a platform that many of them felt that they hadn't had before to be able to express their concerns, their ideas, their wishes, their wants, and to engage with their government at both national and county level. And that's one of the unique things about this as well. Second, it is a local, it's a local owned, national and local owned initiative. It's working together with the local stakeholders and with the local government and the national government or county governments in the case of Kenya. And that's important. It's important because these initiatives, these, these access initiatives, not, everything is different in every country, so you have to work at that local level. And then the third issue, of course, it is action orientated. Now, I'm wearing the Stop TB badge here because, as you know, there's the other high-level meeting taking place as well, the high-level meeting on TB, which is actually the first on TB. But there are synergies. There is so much in common, not just the fact that we're talking about patients and people, but, in fact, the hurdles, the challenges are essentially the, sh the same. We're talking essentially about health systems. We're talking about how to make supply efficient. We're talking about the failure of diagnostics and diagnosis. We're talking about improving primary care. We're talking about awareness. We're talking about adherence. And we're talking about stigma as well. These are the issues which are fundamental both from the TB perspective and the NCD perspective. And it's addressing all those issues that initiatives like Access Accelerated are, are trying to do. You have to build a road of access in order to get treatment. In fact, today, uh, the, it was the minister uh, for, for Mozambique who was at uh, the TB in Africa was saying she wanted to build a highway, an accelerated highway. The idea is you've got to have everything in place in order that we can have treatment. And the biopharmaceutical industry isn't just about manufacturing. It's much more than that. It's, it's innovation, it's science, but it's also participating in that delivery. And that's why this is so important. Now, before I, I, I took up this job as ADG some seven months ago, I, I also run, I run the Medicines Patent Pool. It was a UN uh, initiative, which is about accelerating access of HIV products in developing countries through IP partnerships between innovator companies and generics. Now, why I mention it is twofold. One, because it shows the partnerships that industry does. Partnership is key to what industry has done in innovation. It's key in what it does in access. And I think it's very impressive the way that companies seek now more and more. They've changed business models from an old business model, which was more or less sort of donations and the private market, now towards sustainable business models in developing countries. But what's important, in order to have a sustainable business model, you have to be able to deal with all these issues, as I mentioned before, in building that roadway. The second point is it's not just about one issue. It's not just about IP or, or affordability or price or whatever. It really is a holistic approach that needs to be done in public health, whether it's NCDs, whether it's HIV, whether it's TB. And in HIV, we've seen such an amazing outcome because many of the things were in place. Donor funding, essentially some form of universal health care coverage, political will, 
people involvement, treatment programs, supply, and innovation. It was all there. And now we've got to see how we can be able to do that in other areas. And I think the role of the private sector, making SDG 17 a reality, and that becoming a key point in being able to deliver, is what initiatives like Access Accelerated and others are important to do. So having seen, I think, the First Lady coming to the room, and I'm disappointed, I'm sure, I'm, as, I, as you were and I am, I'm not the First Lady, and I was, the First Lady is supposed to be the first speaker. Um, I would like then just to finalize on the point of we're going to walk the talk together in partnership. Thank you very much. Greg, thanks very much indeed for that. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce a prominent First Lady who's been widely praised for her unstinting efforts to improve health care. As the Vice President of the Influential Organization of Africa First Ladies Against HIV AIDS, she has been instrumental in the drive to improve access to affordable medicines and treatment. She's also the founder of Foundation Kimi, which works to pre support preventive health care <laughs> I hope that wasn't an ominous sign. Uh, preventive healthcare, including early diagnosis and prevention of breast and uterus cancers. I'm very pleased to introduce Her Excellency Ajuavi Sika Kabore, the First Lady of Burkina Faso. Oh, and I should actually point out before we do this, I should have said this at the beginning, translation pods, you've probably found this out for yourself uh, by now, um, but we have English and French. Uh, English is on six and French is on channel four. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Alors, bonsoir tout le monde. <rire> Distingués invités, mesdames et messieurs, tout protocole respecté. Permettez-moi de vous parler du cancer parmi les maladies non transmissibles. Parce qu'il s'agit d'une pathologie pour laquelle j'ai engagé une lutte féroce depuis longtemps. Les estimations avancées pour 2018 selon l'OMS sont de 18,1 millions de nouveaux cas de cancer dans le monde et un homme sur cinq, une femme sur six dans le monde aura un jour le cancer. Les cancers vont tuer près de 10 millions de personnes dans le monde en 2018. Ainsi, une femme meurt toutes les deux minutes dans le monde du fait du cancer du col de l'utérus. En Afrique, près de 35 000 nouveaux cas de cancer du col de l'utérus sont diagnostiqués chaque année pour 100 000 femmes et environ 23 000 femmes sur les 100 000 vont en mourir. Ce sont des chiffres véritablement alarmants. Avec Kimi, la fondation que je préside depuis dix ans, je me suis fortement engagée dans la lutte contre le cancer du sein et du col de l'utérus. Avec Kimi, j'ai sillonné le Burkina Faso, mon pays, de part en part, pour des campagnes de sensibilisation, pour des campagnes de formation des prestataires sanitaires assortis de campagnes de dépistage parce que le cancer du col de l'utérus est un cancer évitable et dépisté à temps, le cancer du sein peut être soigné sans trop de frais avec la conservation du sein. J'ai parcouru également à l'international le monde pour affirmer mon engagement dans la lutte contre le cancer. Marrakech, Addis Abeba, New York, Istanbul, Paris, Djeddah et j'en passe. Par ailleurs, 
Des rencontres internationales de lutte contre le cancer ont été organisées à Ouagadougou sous mon leadership. En novembre 2017, l'année dernière, j'ai réuni les ministres de la Santé de la zone UEMOA, à laquelle appartient le Burkina Faso. Et plus récemment, en août 2018, ce sont les pays africains du groupe de l'Organisation de coopération islamique qui se sont réunis à Ouagadougou avec à leur tête les Premières Dames. Malgré cela, les chiffres de la désolation liée au cancer continuent de progresser. La progression du cancer, de la situation du cancer de nos jours, surtout dans nos pays en développement, nous amène à nous demander si nous sommes véritablement entendus. Aujourd'hui comme hier, nous appelons à une solidarité agissante, à l'instar de ce qui s'est fait contre le VIH sida il y a quelques années. Cela a été le fer de lance de la lutte contre le VIH sida avec les victoires connues. Et je n'oublie pas l'apport inestimable de l'Organisation des Premières Dames d'Afrique contre le sida, OBDAS, que je préside. Nous appelons à une diplomatie sanitaire aujourd'hui pour lutter contre le cancer. J'en appelle tout simplement à l'humanité des fabricants des produits anticancéreux et des, produits et des équipements de lutte contre le cancer. Pendant que vos innovations sont destinées à améliorer le sort et à sauver l'humanité, toutes les deux minutes, une femme meurt quelque part du cancer du col de l'utérus dans le monde. Aujourd'hui, l'organisation des Premières Dames contre le sida que je préside, en raison des ravages occasionnés par le cancer, a décidé de s'engager dans cette lutte et de mettre tout son poids sur cet, sur cet engagement pour éliminer les cancers du sein et du col de l'utérus. Parce que ce sont les femmes, en plus, qui payent le plus lourd tribut. Nous avons beaucoup appris à travers le VIH SIDA dans notre région africaine et nous savons que nous devons élaborer une stratégie durable en termes de plaidoyer, de recherche de financement et de formation de ressources humaines qualifiées pour vaincre le cancer. Nous savons qu'il y a beaucoup de travail à faire pour soutenir nos systèmes de santé. Le cancer a besoin de beaucoup de capacités. Notre souhait aujourd'hui et que vous puissiez nous accompagner en appuyant notre action et notre engagement dans nos pays respectifs. La lutte contre le cancer suppose l'accès au traitement anticancéreux à des coûts abordables et l'accès à différents traitements comme la radiothérapie, la chirurgie, la chimiothérapie, à des coûts abordables pour nos populations. Cela suppose également qu'on lève les barrières entre les patients et les fabricants d'équipements et de produits anticancéreux et qu'on supprime les intermédiaires. Je sais qu'ensemble, nous pouvons triompher de ce fléau. Il est temps d'agir et je sais pouvoir compter sur votre sens de l'humanité pour booster la lutte contre le cancer en Afrique. Je vous remercie pour votre aimable attention. Merci beaucoup. And now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce a tremendous leader in global health and NCDs. She's been an NCD advocate in her home country of Pakistan, where in 1999 she left a successful career as Pakistan's first woman cardiologist to establish the NGO think tank Heartfile a powerful advocate for health reform in Pakistan. And in 2013, she served as a federal minister in Pakistan's interim government and was instrumental in establishing Pakistan's Ministry of Health. She's lent her expertise to numerous global organizations, including the WHO, the World Economic Forum, and the Clinton Global Initiative. Most notably for us today, she is the co-chair of the WHO's high-level independent commission on non-communicable diseases. And the Commission's report, which was released this June, is a critically important document in shaping our discussions both today and at the upcoming high-level meeting. Please welcome Dr. Sanya Nishtar.
Your Royal Highness Princess Dina, uh, Excellency the First Lady of Burkina Faso, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very good evening. Uh, let me begin by congratulating Axis Accelerated for having come this far and for the partners that put it together. Um, I had the privilege of being at the launch of the um, uh, initiative at Davos about a year ago, and it's wonderful to see it concretize and charge ahead um, and forge a scope of work that is much needed to address the world's leading killers. For a very long time, I had wondered why there wasn't a partnership focused on non-communicable diseases. I mean, if you look at the history of partnerships in global health for the last three decades, there are over 100 partnerships for conceivably every infectious disease on this planet. Uh, and many of them have given us remarkable results in terms of eradicating disease, uh, reducing disease burden, saving lives. Um, and the public and private sector for a very long time have gotten together to forge these relationships uh, and drive progress and achieve impact. But this one area which inherently requires a multi-sectoral partnership-based response, there wasn't even a single partnership focused on that for a very long time. Uh, I recall in 2007, I wrote a piece in The Lancet asking why that was the case. On the margins of the first high-level meeting in 2011, I again wrote a piece. And, uh, and, and then, of course, in 2017, I made a very strong call. Um, when I was campaigning as one of the three finalists for Director General of WHO back in 2017, I had the privilege of meeting 194 country delegations at various, you know, at the head of state, at the foreign minister, at, at the health minister level. I visited 70 countries physically, and most of the ministers of health were so preoccupied um, thinking about the problems that in NCDs pose. That is actually the reality of ground. And across those seven, 70 countries in hospitals and hospices and communities, I saw the ravages of this disease. Uh, primary health care, not integrating NCDs, not even the simple measures, um, and people suffering from needless renal failure with with, with, with eye diseases, with gangrenes, with, unaccept, with heart failure, with unacceptable preventable uh, complications. So I could completely understand why the ministers of health were asking for help. They were crying out for help, most of the ones that I met, especially from the low and middle income countries. And in fact, this is not just my own personal impressions. If you look carefully at uh, the data from the country cooperation strategies of the World Health Organization, which is the instrument through which they ascertain country needs for technical assistance, you will clearly see, and these data are in the public domain, uh, that technical assistance for non-communicable diseases is their first ask. But it is just that we have been so tight with the purse strings to fund this area. We have been so sparing to uh, forge the development of partnerships that, and dedicated institutional arrangements that can deliver that there has been very little progress. In fact, if you reflect back in the history of global health and, and try to assess what the key ingredients are to deliver success in terms of controlling and preventing a disease, they have, there are consistently three factors at play. It is dedicated funding, it is a clear strategy, and the existence of a dedicated institutional arrangement with partnerships as its key feature. And, and that, that partnership piece has been missing for NCDs for a very long time. So this is a very long-winded way of saying how delighted I am to see this partnership come together uh, and to take root uh, in its first year. Uh, at this year at the UNGA, there's be also been the launch of the DEFEAT NCD partnership, and I think these two partnerships together are very important uh, vehicles to vehicle to drive forward change and reform, uh, especially with with their public, private, civil society 
individuals and community construct um, with multilateral partnership within the mix. The importance of forging such collaborations has clearly been laid out in the framing of the Sustainable Development Goals. The 2011 political declaration was very clear in outlining the need to forge such partnerships. And in fact, when the High-Level Commission on Non-Communicable Diseases, which I have the honor of co-chairing, um, framed its report, we clearly recognized that despite the mandate to create those partnerships, progress has been unacceptably slow. And therefore, there is the need to accelerate the development of especially public-private linkages. In the report, we clearly outlined the need for, for governments to charge ahead uh, with progress in this area for multilateral entities to support them. And the Commission report explicitly uh, called for the construct of two in institutional arrangements to further these objectives at the country level and at the global and regional levels. We called for the creation of, uh, of an investors forum so that we could somehow have a dialogue with them uh, and could encourage them to uh, invest in areas that were health promoting, that were di that were disease protecting, and the other forum that the commission called for in terms of creation was more a solutions oriented forum, and we look forward to uh, both these fora getting up and running uh, soon. Uh, also, our commission, in in the public private frame. Uh, called for active engagement with behavioral economists and marketing experts so that we could somehow work together to stem the tide and learn from areas where the private sector was stronger in terms of understanding, in, in terms of ex uh, expertise, technical expertise. Um, more broadly, the commission had six recommendations. Uh, we re reiterated the importance of heads of state to take responsibility uh, rather than the ministries of health because we realized that a lot of time the, the, the ministries of health, um, uh, that's not where you have to sell your point because they're already on board. But the nature of the changes that you're asking for, specifically in the fiscal and regulatory domains, uh, with regard to NCDs are the kind that pits them against their other cabinet colleagues. So the commission made a recommendation for the heads of state to take this, uh, to embrace this agenda. And we're delighted that on Thursday, more than 50 heads of state are going to come together at the high level meeting uh, on non-communicable diseases uh, to make pledges and commitments. This is really a very auspicious moment. And we hope that these are going to cascade into tangible commitments and implementation. Uh, very rightly, the tagline of your event today is action, and that's really what we need at ground. Our commission has also called for prioritization so that we focus on those key interventions that are needed to meet SDG uh, target 3.4. Uh, we've explicitly made a call for independent accountability, and I'm sure you all know that the Lancet has just published its countdown. Uh, on NCDs, the, the, the status does not look good, uh, and, and, and I don't have to invent it to outline you know, the dismal picture. Clearly, there's need for progress. Uh, our commission, in addition to the broader fiscal and regulatory measures, has made an explicit call for the integration of non-communicable diseases into universal health coverage plans. And we strongly feel that without the inclusion of NCDs, which are the world's leading killers, the foremost killers, uh, it would be a tragic missed opportunity if universal health coverage plans did not factor them into their framing. We could actually end up uh, undermining the economic case for universal health coverage if that was the case. So, and of course, there are a number of different uh, other recommendations uh, that, that we have, which, which we're going to track as we go forward. But in terms of your partnership, in terms of how this links uh, with, uh, with the recommendations, we look at your partnership as an important uh, instrument to further the recommendations of the High-Level Commission on, uh, on NCDs. Um, health systems is a very important pillar on which you construct the whole edifice of universal health coverage and access to medicine, which is very, which features very prominently in the framing of what you are set out to achieve, is of course one of the very, um, very important objectives that has to be achieved, not just for medicines, 
access to medicines, but also access to devices, uh, access to diagnostics. And I noted in, that in your mix of partnerships, it is not just the uh, pharma companies, but it is also those that have the capacity to further access to devices and diagnostics that, that are featured. Um, so, so to conclude, I think that your partnership can play a very important role because of the comparative advantage of the various partners. You have the, the World Bank on board, uh, and the World Bank's point of contact in countries is not the Ministry of Health. It is the Ministry of Finance, which, which actually calls the shots. Uh, so I think for the bank to be talking about the importance of NCDs, of access to medicines, is critical, uh, it, which is why one of the streams of work of our commission is to make the case that NCDs impact human capital. Uh, this week at the UN General Assembly, President Jim Kim is going to be launching the human capital initiatives, basically indicating that the borrowing costs of countries are going to be tied to their human capital rankings. And our commission made a very strong recommendation that the impact of NCDs on, on, uh, on, on human capital performance uh, must be ascertained and must be factored into the calculation. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that with the bank in, in the construct of your partnerships, you have an opportunity to um, bring to bear the importance of NCDs, uh, not, on, not just on the ministries of health, but on the ministries of finance, which is a huge sea change from how public policy uh, is delivered towards, um, uh, towards a health priority. Uh, of course, you also have a number of different uh, private sector, multinational corporations, uh, and of course, your expertise in management, your expertise in logistics and supply chains uh, is, uh, is, is something that health systems of the low and middle income countries can, can benefit from um, in terms of reducing inefficiencies, and, and you all know that there are lots of them. And of course, there, then there, there is the civil society the UICC most saliently and the other civil society entities who are part of the mix of uh, your partnership who have this massive ability to convene apex organizations and thousands of professional associations on the ground who have very important connections not just with governments but with people, with, with, with civil society. And I think this is a wonderful mix um, and there are many, there's huge potential to capitalize on sharing of experiences. And I think the next step should be to, uh, to try to ascertain what kind of financing instruments we need to, um, uh, to marry the demonstration projects that you're putting on ground. I had an opportunity to look through the report that you have, uh, and I thumbed through the various different initiatives in different parts of the world with different entry points that you're putting on ground. And I think it would be a logical next step, very much in line with the international thinking on how resources for a development should flow, uh, to, to identify those catalytic instruments that can be dovetailed with the projects that you are putting on ground. And that's exactly what the High Level Commission on NCD envisaged when it talked about the multi-donor trust fund. This, we did not envisage a global fund-like instrument. We envisaged a catalytic instrument. And I see that dovetailing very nicely uh, with, with what you've created. So I just want to conclude by saying that uh, that there is an enormous suffering on ground, and people like us see it on a day-to-day -day basis. Those of us who are engaged with, with people, with patients on ground, uh, the work that you're doing and trying to bring them closer to treatment, to, cre to cure, to rehabilitation, to palliative care is urgently needed. It is, it is desperately needed, and it's time we put uh, action uh, at the forefront of public policy in this area. Thank you very much for the work you do. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much indeed for that. Some 
important points about cross-sector um, collaboration, which is uh, one of the things we're going to be discussing in the panel, and uh, uh, some, uh, uh, on the subject of important partners that we work with on the ground. Very lovely to see Her Royal Highness uh, Princess Dina Mered, who is, of course, the president of the Union of International Cancer Control and UICC, very important partner, working to push uh, screening and uh, prevention and diagnosis and care of cancer into um, national health plans in, in, in low- and middle-income countries countries. So these are the things that we are now going to be uh, looking at on our first panel. We're going to be discussing the lessons learned when it comes to taking global commitments to NCDs and applying them to local context because uh, as our speakers have, have amply pointed out, there is not one size fits all, not one cookie cutter approach that we can take. What works in one context doesn't work in another. So how do we make local action more impactful and effective. So please let me welcome my first panel to the stage. Um, uh, we have Dr. Kibachio Joseph Mwangi, who joins us from Kenya, head of the NCD division at Kenya's Ministry of Health. Uh, Dr. Gathinji Gitahi, the global CEO of Amref uh, AMREF Health Africa, that's Africa's largest independent health development organization. Dr. Joseph Lebega, a pediatric hematologist oncology, oncologist and currently the medical director for the Global Hope Program in Uganda. And of course, Dr. Sanya Nishta, uh, who we've heard from, uh, CEO of Heartfile and co-chair of the High Level Commission on NCDs. Uh, can I invite my first panelists to the guests, uh, to the stage? And I'm going to move over to the far side there. Right, hopefully everybody's microphone is switched on. Okay, so the way it's going to work is this. I'm going to uh, grill them lightly for uh, the next few minutes. And, uh, and then you guys can have uh, an, an even stronger go. There should be a couple of microphones uh, in the audience coming to you. If you want to ask a question, please uh, make it concise to the point that we can get through more and direct it at the person you think uh, can best answer it, okay? All right. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Cabaccio because you and I have spoken before. Um, we have uh, spoken in Kenya about um, integrating NCDs into the health system. And I know you're very passionate about that. Um, but what, are, what, in your view, are the main barriers to getting that done? Okay. Thank you, Shirley. Um, it's been a long day. And when you say you're about to grill us, uh, makes me panic. Very uh, lightly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's been an interesting day in this very venue, uh, talking almost around the same um, issue of um, how do we leverage uh, the idle capacity or the um, capacity thereof from the other um, uh, diseases or primary care platforms for NCDs. Um, and you've asked what are the barriers. From my perspective, I think these barriers, you can look at them right from policy. Uh, in my country, there are some policies which you would uh, not imagine that um, they are uh, holding back um, uh, integration. Uh, and by integration here, we mean integrating NCDs into primary care platforms, into mainstreaming them to be easier. Um, in my country, there's a policy about um, at the lower you go into the health um, system, uh, the nurses and the clinical officers become the managers of health. And unfortunately, some of them are not enabled to uh, by policy. Uh, of course, if we task shift to them, they would be able to handle. But by policy, there are some barriers. Um, why I say this is a barrier is occasionally in pr health practice, um, practice precedes policy sometimes and that's the time when you are worried that uh, policy is behind. When you see people in the lower levels trying to integrate even without a policy on integration, that tells you that that's the right thing to do. It's only that governments work sometimes slowly and um, some people are frustrated and start doing it on their own. And, and when I go into the field, I find people um, with HIV, TB and malaria asking me, look, my CD4 is all right, my viral load is zero. But I have hypertension. Nobody talks to me about hypertension. So who will do this? So that's a question that is asked to government, telling them that you are slow. 
you are supposed to be giving a holistic approach, but you are still siloing us. That's one. Two, I think the other barrier to uh, integration is the stovepipe nature of financing. Financing comes as this is HIV money, this is TB money, and it's so rigid um, that you cannot uh, be able to utilize it for other things. Let me give an example in my country. Close to three quarters of the people who have HIV anyway have an NCD or a risk factor or something that we should be talking about. The, NC the HIV community have the 90-90-90 uh, campaign of making sure we diagnose 90% of those who have HIV, treat 90% of them, and ensure that 90% of them have viral suppression. And it's assumed that the story has ended there. I wish they would also add an extra 90 percent saying that those who have viral suppression, at least 90 percent of them have access to a universal health coverage that includes uh, NCDs and mental health. Because um, the same person, and it's, it's tiring to treat people's diseases and not treat people. You need to treat people, not their diseases. When a mother comes to me, comes as a mother, doesn't come branded as whatever diseases. We are the ones who brand them. So we are the ones who even imp impose uh, these barriers. And then the final um, reasoning about uh, barriers to integration is the exclusivity. Every program wants to be exclusive. If you look at the HIV, TB, malaria, and even as NCDs, some of them have beautiful graphs that have shown mortality coming down. Of course, holding hands with these uh, fellas from NCDs who have no money might spoil our graph. You know, we, we, we might have now, and, and sometimes people hold back, uh, not for any particular reason, but because um, we are used to doing these things this way, and uh, it's difficult for a program that is fully funded to partner with a program that is not funded um, because of personal issues. I, I'm going to put you on the spot now because yeah. the last time I heard you speak, you said, next time I talk, mm -hmm. I don't want to be talking about what we want to do. I want you to ask me what That's I have doing. done. Yes. Let me start by a program that we have started with the TB program. TB and diabetes now are brothers and sisters as HIV and TB back then. So in my country, we realize that TB patients are hiding among us uh, diabetes patients, and uh, an opportunity is here. When a TB patient comes, uh, we can screen them for diabetes, and when a uh, diabetes patient comes, we can ad administer to them a questionnaire to see if they have a likelihood of having TB. So there is no extra resource required. This patient was to come anyway. So we have partnered with the TB program, and I must thank the TB guys. They are doing an awesome job, and they have opened up their platform to say we can be able to uh, do bidirectional screening. And we have discovered a lot of patients uh, into the TB program, and they also have been able to put a lot of our patients into care. So that's just a simple example that shows you that when there is willingness and collaboration at the policy level, when diseases come together, then we as health workers must come together. Okay, so leveraging existing infrastructure. Yes. Um, Dr. Gathinji, uh, AMREF is uh, it, it is one of those organisations which is the epitome of making partnerships and I know that um, you're committed to universal health coverage. You work with many, many uh, different partners from all across the, the sectors. What kind of partnerships are necessary to achieve the best progress? Uh, I think the most, we have many partnerships, but I think the most fundamental and phenomenal partnership we have, surprise, surprise, is with communities. Mm -hmm. It's making sure that communities are central to everything we do. And for us to partner with communities, we use the currency of trust. Just making sure that we bridge the gap, what we call the social distance, and we bridge the gap and communities can allow us into their lives for us to be able to then co-create solutions for them. So that's by far our most um, transformative partnership. Is this about empowering people who are living with these conditions? It, it's, it's about actually empowering them to take uh, care of themselves. It's actually working with them to trust us to say, uh, and us to trust them to say, you can actually take care of these things. All you need is empowerment, is for us to train you, to tell you what to do. And we do that through a very simple tool called community health workers. We train community health workers, but who are identified by the communities themselves. So the communities say, we, we tell them, we need one of you to do these things. And they sit in a baraza and they say, we are going to appoint so and so. We take that person, we train them, we empower them, and then after that, they then continue to serve that community. 
So the discussion that we are having is how do we extend that partnership to, to actually tool them to do the things that we've told them to do. And we are now working with the next partnership, which is private sector, to say how does private sector now come in with technology and diagnostics to help these communities of health worker that now when they go to the community, they don't just walk in and say, how are you today? They also have a blood pressure machine that actually they carry forward and then use it to do uh, the tests on the people that they are visiting through the blood pressure and then refer to them. Without that partnership, we will not be reaching the 14 million people we are reaching every year. Because we can't do that with our staff. I only have a staff of maybe 1,300. But we reach 15 million people. Why? Because of our most important partnership with communities. In Kenya alone, I think we are working with close to 90,000 community health workers. And they are volunteers. So this partnership is for us by far the most important because these communities are also the people who are living with these conditions. They are people who know the conditions under which the patients are living. And therefore, it's, when you're working with the community, you're working with the people living in those conditions. So this is by far the most important partnership that we have. And, and making it sustainable as well so that it is something that can continue in the long term. Is this how uh, you can build skills? and capacity and make sure that there is a workforce that can, can deal with NCDs? That is true, but this word sustainability is a bit difficult. Uh, we talk about it in forums like this, uh, but in actual sense, uh, sustainability just means being able to maintain what the community is doing. So it starts with ownership. Sustainability is actually about ownership. So what we do is that we ensure that the communities we work with don't see this as a project that has been brought to them, right. but as a project they own and they initiated themselves, and therefore they're able to maintain beyond whether we are there or not, whether we, you know, we're in the community or not. So sustainability, most importantly, even when we are working with government, sustainability is about ownership. It's about doing a, a partnership with government that actually co-creates the solution so the government owns it, and therefore even after we have taken them through the capacity developed, then they own it. And how do, how do they own it? They own it through policy. I'll give an example of training, what we've done on training. Um, many years ago, we said, we're working with community health workers, and we need them to be owned by the government. So there's a community partnership on one hand, and there's a government partnership on the other. So we work with the government to develop the community health strategy and policy. So then the government now owns that. We then work with the government and the private sector to create a way of training community health workers on mobile phone, where there is no internet, using texts and voice. So we look for a private sector partner, who is Safaricom, which is a telecom company. And we say, can we work together to develop a mode of training community health workers in their community through this government-approved curriculum and policy so that eventually we can train them where they are? And we develop a, a, you know, a, a very unique platform called LEAP that we now use to train community health workers that's already owned by the government. Yeah. And that then creates us in a bit. And, and that kind of digital yes. technology is really interesting. And we're yes. going to talk a lot about that on panel too. But that is one of the things that, that, that we can uh, look to work on. Um, Dr. Joseph, let me, come to, let me come to you because uh, I know that you work with children. And there must be unique challenges in dealing with that. So tell us about your work. Thank you. Yeah. So, so uh, first of all, um, before I emphasize the challenge of the children, is for us to recognize that um, most countries in Africa, about 60% of the population or more is children. And so they're really the majority of people in these countries. They're the future of Africa. And everything you do in terms of health has to focus on them. You cannot look over them, over the children. Um, many people don't recognize that children suffer non-communicable diseases a lot. As a matter of fact, in developed countries like the USA, the top three causes of death in children are non-communicable. It's uh, birth abnormalities, and many of the children will die as newborns. It's cancer. It's road traffic accidents. Now, do these problems exist in Africa, in other developing countries? Definitely, yes, they exist. It's just that they're unrecognized. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give you an example, uh, the United States uh, sees around 15,000 cases of children with cancer a year. In Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, you're talking about 100,000 children with cancer every year. Now, the more startling difference is that 80% of the children in the United States with cancer will be cured, 
90% of the children in Africa with cancer will die of that diagnosis. Okay. Now, if you think things can't get worse, in the United States, you talk about 60,000 children born with sickle cell disease every year, and 90% of those will grow into adults and have a productive life. In Africa, you're talking about 600,000 children born with sickle cell disease every year, and the majority, 80% of those children, die before the age of five. Mm. Okay? So th this, this is really a dire situation. You talk about non-communicable disease in children. So um, I'm going to tell you about a program, um, the Global Hematology Oncology Program of Texas Children's Hospital, that uh, saw this and has tried to address this problem in Africa. Uh, so um, we started this program in Uganda, and um, uh, we partnered with government. And um, over the last two years, through training health workers, through improving access to drugs and other components of what these children need. Uh, we've moved from a situation where 30% of children with a diagnosis of cancer died by one month, to a situation now where 85% of the children are alive and many of them in remission. 90% um, of the children with leukemia, which is the most common cancer children get, are in remission and alive at one month, okay? Uh, some cancers like lymphomas, lymph node cancers, we have 80% of children being cured. The sickle cell wards are now empty because uh, we've controlled the pain crisis, the strokes these children we are getting, and they're out in school and doing what uh, children do. So if you're talking about access and creating a high wave access, this is an example where in two years, you've created access, really accelerated access, and you're really making an impact. So how, how do you expand that? Uh, and, and how far does that depend on, on effective public-private partnership? Exactly. So, so many, many of the, the issues that uh, my colleagues have mentioned are key in making sure that you achieve this and you sustain it. So one is integration. So we've achieved this by integrating the care of children with cancer and blood diseases, sickle cell disease, with HIV programs. A Baylor College of Medicine takes us children for over 10 years, treated children with HIV in Africa, taking care of over a million children, created very strong programs integrated with government, and uh, through support of actually Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation, again, this is, fits very well with this uh, uh, theme today, where you have a pharmaceutical private sector coming in to support such a program. And, and instead of f focusing on this dichotomy of communicable diseases versus non-communicable diseases, we said the resources are there. The resources that children with HIV need, many of them overlap with the resources that children with cancer, children with sickle cell need. So we came together and were able to make a lot of progress very fast. Uh, we've trained people in East Africa to a point where we are training a pediatric cancer and blood specialist for Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania to a situation where uh, two years ago there was none in Uganda, there was one in Kenya, there was none in Tanzania, and now we have seven specialists in the region. We've trained nurses, surgeons, uh, critical care specialists. So you, you build a whole uh, a system that is focused on taking care of children, try to provide them with the facilities to do their job, try and avoid focusing on the disease, but focusing on what the children need, like my colleague again said, don't focus on the disease, focus on the, on the people. Right. And when you do that, uh, you hopefully create a sustainable, uh, sustainable program. And one of the things clearly children need in Africa is children's hospitals. Uh, we, we pediatricians say our mantra is children are not small adults. Uh, even when you have very well functioning systems, those systems need always to, in a very special way, uh, focus on the children because the needs of adults are typically different from the needs of the, of the children. Dr. Sanya, uh, it, it's clear from, uh, you know, the, the passion and the commitment is there um, to, to integrate NCDs and, and it speaks to a lot of what you were saying, you know, uh, let's not differentiate between the need to treat NCDs uh, and a different approach for communicable diseases. How do we, I mean, speaking with your, you, you, you've got, um, had, you know, experience at global level, national level, local level, how do you translate those global commitments into local action on the ground? 
So I think the problem with NCDs has been that the commitments that have been made globally are not followed up by the nuts and bolts that are required to get the engine moving in countries. So 2011, so look at, so let's compare the, the two summits that were held, you know, with HIV AIDS summit in 2001 and the 2011 uh, summit on NCDs. I mean, after the 2001, and, and these, by the way, were the first two times when the heads of state came together at the General Assembly level to make such high-level commitments. After the 2001 summit on HIV AIDS, there was, there was UN AIDS developed, and I'm not saying that, that that model is to be adopted for NCDs, but to the extent of a dedicated institutional arrangement, there was one created. Uh, funding was mobilized massively, you know, PEPFAR was grounded in so many African countries. We had uh, so many, we had the global funds for aid, TB and malaria. They leveraged the outreach of the World Health Organization. They had special institutional arrangements to draw stakeholders, governments. They were time-bound outcome-based targets. And again, I'm not saying that that is a model to be, that vertical model is to be adopted um, because it has its own challenges. But those notwithstanding, the commitments that were made were followed through by tangible action on ground. And therefore, we saw, we saw action. We, we saw results. Uh, even today, if you go in many African clinics where PEPFAR and the Global Fund for Aid TB and malaria have their operations, you will clearly see that sitting in one clinic, uh, a, a woman for a prenatal with HIV will go, will go across one door when there, where there are computerized uh, appointment books, uh, where there are vouchers for travel, where there are stipend systems to give stipends uh, and incentives. Uh, there are networks created of patients, there is dedicated guidance on compliance, there are medicines available on the shelf. A whole engine of chronic disease management has been created, you know, in many sub-Saharan African countries where, where PHC is, primary health care is at a very basic level. And it's remarkable that those systems have been created. And there's government ownership and community mobilization and, and poor women are benefiting. But out of that same waiting area, the woman who will open the door to go to uh, the diabetic clinic, uh, there will be nothing. But why? Why? They, why is it like that? Why? It, is it, it is like that because programs are structured for for very narrow vertical targets. Um, but, but this is not uh, answering your question directly. So basically, as I said, commitments followed through by action. Uh, but on the other hand, after the 2011 political declaration on NCTs, nothing happened. Nothing happened. We started preparing for 2015 the narrative and SDGs. The narrative of FD SDGs in 2015 was very different. Right. It was country ownership, the, 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 the international system focusing on where it, ha it is having a comparative advantage, no more funding in donor-recipient uh, com compacts. Uh, the, the, the major global funds are moving into graduation. Now, I'm not debating the merits of one model vis-a-vis -vis the other, but all I'm indicating is that the recipient countries, the poorest countries of the world, are used to a certain modicus of engagement. Right. Uh, where the donors bring pools of money with priorities and things get up and running. And in countries like mine, who are not aid dependent, where the bulk of the resources are indigenous, the donor resources are catalytic. So they kind of signal to governments what the priorities are. I recall as a young cardiologist back many years ago, 20 years ago, when I started practicing, and I used to take data from the government's demographic health surveys, the government's um, multiple indicator cluster surveys, the government's social and living standards measurement surveys, which were through the collaboration of multilaterals and bilaterals, and I've told them, your data is telling you 
that it is high blood pressure that is killing people, it is diabetes that is causing the complications. This is not my data, this is your data. And you are here pursuing a set of priorities that are not reflected by disease burden. And, and you know what they turn around and tell me? They say, yes, but we, we understand what you're saying, but why, if it was a priority, the World Bank would be oh. saying it is a priority. <laughs> right. If it right. was a priority, uh, I don't want to name the bilaterals, the bilaterals would be telling us it's a priority. So we, we look at you with some level of skepticism. I think you're better off focusing on your private practice. You're going to make a lot of money. Right. So, uh, so I think this, this, whole, this whole culture that we have developed, uh, and, and we never leveraged that culture, whether it was good or bad, I'm not getting into that debate, but we never leveraged that culture for NCT. So that's, there's got to be a change of, of mindset, which I think we all there's, agree. There's got to be real accountability. I mean, on Thursday, one day from now, there are going to be commitments made. There's going to be a lot of excitement in the room. Uh, and we're going to go back very happy. But what instruments do we have on ground to deliver? I mean, I come to your table with a lot of enthusiasm because I see some action emanating from this. Uh, I mean, we, I've been to a number of different, um, and the private sector has had a, a very important role to catalyze those movements. OK. Um, All right, let's, let's try and get some questions from the floor because uh, I, I it, it, and, and we will we will get more points. Let me let me just get see if there's uh, anyone from the floor want to put a question to one to uh, one one of our panelists, perhaps picking up on some of the points. Uh, lady at the back there with the blonde hair. There's a microphone right behind you. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your comments this afternoon. My name is Michelle Forsley. I wonder if the panel could think a little bit about or ex explore the idea that. Some of the problems we face with ND NCDs have a lot to do with health systems that simply are not functioning well. And how do we distinguish in our planning around NCDs between really addressing the challenges of NCDs versus the challenges of health systems simply not functioning as well as they might? OK. Uh, <coughs> who would like to? Uh, uh, Dr. Kathinji? OK. Yeah. Uh, I think this ties back to something I wanted to say after her contributions, which is about the, the, um, the fact that NCDs are suffering something we call line budgeting, passive budgeting. That's really where they're suffering from. They're suffering this because traditionally our health systems were built for communicable diseases and we created line budgets for these things, for malaria, for the WHO essential drugs kit. Now, when you start having a shift in the disease patterns, that doesn't trigger change from the line budgets because Kibachi wants to go and confirm and uh, kind of motivate the minister to say, I need to increase my budget tenfold because there are more NCDs. Now the minister has to remove that budget from somewhere else because everything is budget. This is a fixed pocket. Now, these are the lines. Until we, we kind of embrace and, and this is what she's talking about, about the inadequacy of the health system. Because the health systems were built through line budgets. And therefore, even when you go, even now, a very good example, if you go to the clinic that she's talking about, and you find what we call the DHIS2, or the District Health Information System, that form that the people feel doesn't have provision for chronic care. It only has single visits. If you come back for hypertension, oh, there's no place to fill you. They have to create a new record for you because they were not created in mind that there would actually be chronic care or there would be repeat visits. So the whole thing is that we have to move away from line budgeting to universal health coverage, where we shift the financing of healthcare to the demand side rather than from the supply side. Because then the demand side is going to respond to all these things and it's going to respond as the disease patterns change. And the health system will adapt to the shift in the disease patterns when you shift and it's, also, it's not just the health system right yeah. i mean when it comes to ncds we have to engage all the sectors so we're talking about education we're talking about transport we're talking about environment and uh who, and who, who's not paid the electricity <laughs> bill <laughs> energy yes um so we have to incorporate all of that and one of the things we were talking about in kenya was that the departments don't talk to each other 
L let me just uh, pick up from what Kitai has said uh, about some of the frustrations in government in terms of the, the system of budgeting, which is a line-based uh, budgeting. Take an example of um, health system strengthening that she has talked about. Now, in NCDs, again, within NCDs are silos. There's a cancer program, there's a diabetes program. They, which each of them have a component of health system strengthening. Mm -hmm. Now, unless we start looking at things in a holistic way, the same system you're strengthening with HIV money is the same, same system that within which diabetes right. exists. But we have to unlock our thinking so that we say, uh, if you're training a nurse um, in, NC, in HIV, with HIV money, or you're training a nutritionist, what sort of difference is there with that nutrition and the nutrition being used for the cancer program? Essentially, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. A nutritionist is a nutritionist. But every program owns their own uh, staff. This is a, a HIV nutritionist or this is a TB nutritionist. And it becomes difficult for that person to be utilized. Now, let me also not run away from the uh, challenge that I was put that sometimes resources are not used in a prudent manner. And you will find that NCDs, apart from being uh, multi-sectoral, there's also a big need um, for investing money upstream. And sometimes we, when we, when we talk of, of the problems in NCDs, we medicalize them. It looks like just by uh, availing resources, uh, essential drugs and uh, technology, that's it. There's a big, big challenge of upstream interventions, um, like tobacco control, like which might not be very um, quick in yielding results. If there's a malaria outbreak in one of my provinces in, Can in Kenya, two weeks later of availing nets and educating people and doing stuff, there's a politician who is, uh, you know, running all the way to the bank because there's some resource to, sh there's something to show. Okay. But for NCDs, for assault campaign, it would take 10 years or something, but do you have the political patience to show that? So we are quick to do the things that are um, fast and radiant in terms of politics. Okay. So that All right, can... another question from the floor. Uh, gentleman in the, uh, who is standing up, there's a microphone coming to you now. Uh, thanks, my name is Bill Keenan. I'm a pediatrician <laughs> representing the International Pediatric Association. Hello to some of my <laughs> friends. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel maybe to consider how to enlarge the pathways forward. And one of the things that we seem to underemphasize, and it's my bias, I'm sure, is maternal and child health. And uh, the impact that um, maternal and child health and its emphasis and investment could have, you know, for we, uh, obesity was mentioned, and uh, breastfed babies have a, a, about a quarter of the of the obesity that formula-fed babies have, and are we not investing in that? In many of the countries that I work in, the breastfeeding rate uh, in, the, in the first hour is about 50%, and it seems like we're missing an opportunity, and why wouldn't we invest in Prevention. that? Prevention, yeah. The, the, the example of sickle cell screening and, and diagnosis and early treatment, you turn a, a potentially very sick child with an early death or a, a late morbidity into a very healthy child and a healthy adult. So there's, it seems like the effectiveness, cost effectiveness that we ought to include, I'm not saying exclude any of the other things, all the operational things that were discussed here, I'm 100% forward. But uh, that m maternal and child health ought to get an additional emphas emphasis in this scheme of how we would move forward on the prevention and management okay. of uh, these chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So looking at maternal and child health, but also looking at prevention uh, and, uh, and leveraging existing um, structures to uh, improve healthcare for NCDs. Would anyone like to talk to that, Joseph? Well, uh, I don't think there's much you can add to what he said. I mean, I don't think there's much you can argue with either. It's, it's a good point. But yeah. I, I just want to contribute to the issue of healthcare systems. And I think it, it's easy for us to, to, you know, to bash healthcare systems in, in developing countries. But I take the perspective of looking at the positives. There are healthcare systems in these countries that have provided HIV and have actually managed to control the epidemic for TB, for malaria. There are a lot of improvements in those areas. And we can leverage those healthcare systems, those structures, to improve uh, non-communicable diseases. And in the example of our program that I gave you, we built this program on a platform of HIV care. 
the HIV programs in these countries have figured out how to maintain. Remember, a patient with cancer, children with cancer, will be in therapy for three months to three years at most. A child with HIV is in care for life. The HIV programs have figured out a way of maintaining a child on therapy for life. If they can do it, you can do it for three years for a child with cancer. They've figured out a way of making sure these children can take multiple pills for HIV for life. If they can do it, we can make a child with sickle cell disease take a pill of hydroxyurea for life. So, so, so there, I, th I think there are so many strengths in there that we just need to build on a okay. leverage. And the key, again, is integration and not look at this as a dichotomy of communicable diseases versus non-communicable diseases. Sanya, did you want to add to that? I wanted to uh, pick on the point that Michelle Forsley with the blonde hair had, and I think she made an excellent point. Because, of course, we talk about the lack of integration of NCDs in primary health care, and I can outline, all of us can outline 20 ways in which you can do that. You know, integrating into national essential drug lists and uh, task shifting and curricula and all that. But the assumption is that the primary health care structures are working and functioning, and that's that's usually not the case. I mean, I, we hide a lot of the ineffic inefficiencies uh, that we see, you know, in nicely couched terms. But basically, a lot, the, the primary care backbone funded by governments, managed by governments in many developing countries are basically ridden, riddled by corruption, you know, blatant corruption. So whether it is informal payments or whether it is absenteeism or whether it is clever bookkeeping or, you know, the, the dual ledgers and uh, the, the hemorrhaging supply chains and the systematic pilferage and, you know, the 20-odd ways in which you can uh, pilfer from, uh, from, from, the, from that value chain. This is outright uh, corruption which is plaguing primary, primary health care systems. And I think that it is shameful for that to happen because in the same countries if you order a pizza or an Uber, you know, the systems will deliver on the objectives of trackability and transparency and accountability and responsiveness and, uh, a, a, and, uh, and in the same down the street you will have a primary care center where governments are going to have a disincentive to deploy the kinds of technologies that are going to obviate this problem. But can I, can so, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to pick up on something that the gentleman was saying because we, we've talked a lot about the primary health care and I'm aware that we're running out of time, but this idea of prevention, we know that many NCDs are linked to morbid obesity um, and diet and lack of activity and a lot of uh, what we're now dealing with could be nipped in the bud from an early age. Uh, the gentleman mentioned um, uh, breastfed children as having less NCDs. So, uh, and, and Her Excellency, the First Lady of Burkina Faso, uh, involved in diagnostics for uh, preventing um, breast and, and cervical cancer. So how, how do we make that uh, a key part of uh, uh, any health system? That, that yeah. uh, you see, um, if you look at the health system, the way the health system is built, and you follow the WHO building blocks, you'll notice that we focus largely on supply side. We have the six building blocks, and they're all supply side, drugs, service delivery, you know, workers, that kind of thing. What is lacking is this thing you're talking about, which is the demand side as a building block, actually activating the communities and then linking them to the supply side. So that you have a full system. Right now it's a subsystem. Now, community engagement, community health workers linked to the, to the health system can address this issue. Because what we find is that you have a lot of people who go, Kibachi will tell you that 75% of our patients go to the hospital, who have cancer, go to the hospital at stage three and four. The reason is because the social distance is there. You have to break that social distance to do prevention. Because the community health workers who go are the ones who interact on a daily basis, and therefore if there's a lady who has a problem, maybe she has a, she'll communicate and they'll talk. They will drive breastfeeding behavior because they go there every day. So this is the one remaining force that we can actually activate to make sure that we stop the upstream as we treat what is existing. Right. Community health strategy. Okay, we've got time for one last question and answer from the audience. Who's going to be the lucky person who gets the last question in? Going once, going twice. <laughs> Go on. Okay, guys. Question uh, about the 
question about the gentleman who talked about the maternal and child health. Yeah. And maybe just to follow up that, we don't uh, lose that. Take an example of a mother who is interacting with the health system. From when she was pregnant, to when she gave birth, to when the child is about 15 years. That mother will go to the hospital about um, 12 times. Four times it was ANC, about four to five times um, the child is being vaccinated, another few, five times the child was sick, diarrhea and vomiting. Majority of all those times she was in the hospital, she was not sick. An opportunity was there for you to talk about nutrition, for you to tell her about diabetes, because she was not ill, she was just coming for routine care. Now mothers in Africa determine what we eat, they determine how children grow, they determine what sort of games children play, whether they play with their phones or go and run outside. They have a Maternal health is a beautiful entry point for prevention of NCDs. Unfortunately, we don't utilize it. Within uh, my uh, government, the maternal and child health um, space is just so rigidly thought about that this is just for that. And we have tried, for example, to partner with these guys and say, can we um, screen these guys, uh, take an example of screening for diabetes. We use the wrong test, we use the urine test at the wrong time, on the wrong, so we are looking for the right thing, but at the wrong time. So we are missing the point of utilizing that platform that you talked about. It has been shown that uh, nutrition during pregnancy has a big bearing on the uh, outcome of this child later in life in terms of NCDs. And so I would emphasize, and he had made a very beautiful point, that maternal and child health inputs into prevention of NCDs is beautiful. And look at the children. You don't just wake up one day and become a drunkard or start smoking. You start when you're a small child. That's when these behaviors reinforce. You don't just become lazy and not uh, physically active. You start as a child. So it's a beautiful platform that we can um, integrate NCDs into, and it does not cost much, yeah. but it's quite reinforcing in itself. Uh, and, that, and that's an excellent point. If you, if you can um, sort of change behavior from a very early age, then perhaps you can avoid these problems in sure. later life. Um, thank you very much indeed for your questions. I uh, really appreciate that. Thank you very much indeed to my uh, first panel. Um, some great points there and some, uh, you know, a lot of things to think about as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Thanks guys. Thank you. Don't forget to take your microphones off. <laughs> Don't walk off with them. Thank you. I'm going to stay here. Okay. We are going to bring our second panel uh, onto the stage. And, uh, and this is going to look at the best way to collaborate and foster cross-sector partnerships. We talked a little bit, a bit about it in there. We're going to talk about it more, uh, how best to access affordable quality healthcare, because we all recognize, or we should do by now, uh, that the battle against NCDs doesn't just involve the health sector, right? Um, now, Kenya was the first uh, focus country for Access Accelerator to look at building relationships and identify opportunities for deeper collaboration. Uh, so I'm very pleased to, uh, to bring to the stage uh, Dr. Eva Njenga, the uh, chair of the NCD Alliance Kenya, Leah Kalenga, founder of Sexy Sickle Cell, passionate advocates for sickle cell awareness in Kenya. Dr. Catherine Karakezi, the Medical Director at the Kenya Diabetes Management and Information Center. I like that you've left yeah. this gap here. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Was it something I said? <laughs> and, uh, and Dr. Edward Omite, the Medical Advisor at Farm Access Foundation, which connects people to affordable healthcare through mobile technology. Thank you, guys. Right, Eva, let's start with you because you and I have spoken uh, before about um, putting people living with NCDs at the centre of any kind of uh, policy making platform. Why is that important? Cool. Do I have the whole afternoon? No, you don't have the whole afternoon. <laughs> uh, thank you, Shure. I, I, think, um, I think it goes without saying. Honestly, I don't even think it's a point of, I don't know whether well, it's a point of discussion. Just your cleavage. Workers. Yeah, there you go. Lovely. We, uh, as uh, uh, an NCD uh, civil society, uh, realize that it doesn't really matter what we say, and I'm really hoping everybody realizes that if you don't involve the people you are discussing at the table, at the uh, earliest point, whatever you are doing is really not going to go far. Because Dr. Cabaccio was saying and made the point um, that you can't just, you're not treating the disease, you're treating the person. You know, um, 
several years ago, I did some, uh, a course, uh, in my fellowship in medical anthropology. And I still remember when I, this is the Harvard Club, as we were in a meeting earlier, I was looking at the pictures to see whether I would see one of uh, Professor Arthur Crayman, he's a psychiatrist. And uh, he, he talked to us uh, when we were there collaborating with social sciences and told us the problem with you physicians is that people come to you with symptoms. You send them home with a disease. And we are very good at that. Not only do we send them maybe even with one, we may send them with several diseases because we make the diagnosis. Thank you. Yeah, we make the diagnosis, or rather we think we are making the diagnosis, so we will send them home with diabetes, hypertension, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So one person who came because they had joint pains, they had a headache, by the time they get out of your door in your uh, private clinic, they have several diseases that they go home with, and we are very good at that. And I think that has to stop, and it's just dealing with people living with NCDs uh, in our association that we have realized we need to talk to them early. We need to know how do we want. They told us uh, earlier this year we had a meeting and you were there. And you saw we came out with a fantastic advocacy uh, agenda report made by the people living with NCDs. And they gave us asks at every level, starting from the top politicians and even up to their own uh, associations and said, this is what we want. This is the way we want to be referred as. This is the way, as you talk uh, at your high-level meetings, as you talk at your uh, various civil societies, even the government ministries, this is the way. When you talk about me having cancer, this is the way I want you to address me, because you, I am the one who knows what I go through when you talk about chemo. This is what we were talking about. It was really interesting when we were in Kenya um, that uh, on some conditions like diabetes or cancer, there was very little knowledge about it until the person was diagnosed and then they became the expert in their condition or they were carers for someone who had the condition and they became very knowledgeable about it, didn't they? So how are you trying to put, uh, you know, what are you doing for people living with NCDs and, and to try and put them into the center of the, the planning process? What, uh, what our association has done is that we have about 30 associations under the umbrella. We're just an umbrella. The society is just an umbrella of many groups that have come together to work towards, uh, this, I mean, removing the stigma of NCDs and also putting the NCDs as a priority for the people who are making policy. So we have associations, we have partners, and I'm so glad to see Dr. Getahi here. AMLEF has been one of the really good partners. We have the <coughs> most important partners for us are the associations or the groups by people living with NCDs. And she was running away from me because we've been together from the day we left Nairobi. She leads a fantastic group on sickle cell in Kenya. And she really is the champion who should be talking, not me. Well, uh, I mean, uh, Leah, uh, Eva's quite right. You, uh, you are the, you know, the person that embodies um, empowerment exactly. and, and taking action and being a, a passionate advocate uh, for people living with a condition. Um, tell us how you're influencing or impacting um, people who have this condition. I don't to know take control. My mic is working. Well, I'm hoping that is uh, are the lapel mics working. Give it a go and see. Yes. Is it working? Yes. Okay. Um, so, influencing and impact, you have to be in a specific mind frame to view yourself beyond the patient and see the problems that other patients as yourself see or experience. Um, I am not a patient as I'm seated here. I am a person with this thing called sickle cell. So you guys referring me as a patient is, is not right because I'm not in hospital. So that is the first thing, okay? And um, for influence, it's being able to see the things that pained you, that pushed you to, to, to become an advocate, and how can you be able to solve them? How can you be able to rise above just telling your story to, being, to your story being a change agent in governments, in decision makers, in institutions like Eva creates, being able to understand the health systems? Because I 
do not have a degree in policy or economics. I am not a doctor. I'm just a girl who has a passion for not seeing other people walk through the struggles that I went through. Struggles of not having health care insurance. Struggles of not having medication when I need it. Struggles of being in a hospital and the doctor asking you, so what do you, Lea, what do you normally do when you're, when you're like that? You know? Like this is not, not something that needs to be happening in the 21st century. And you live with sickle cell and you're told, oh, by the way, Lea, we are very surprised that you made it be up, up to this age. Because even doctors say that they don't make it beyond the age of five. So for me, I had to step ahead of that. I was given this opportunity to, to have a family that made me understand what sickle cell is maybe come into my own, to be able to live beyond this age bracket that they gave me, to understand that it is not right that we don't have doctors who understand sickle cell or medication in pharmacies for pain and children being locked away in rooms because their families cannot handle their screams because they don't have pain management. People living with crazy disabilities because Sickle cell is, is just a crazy disease, OK? So for me to have this impact, how can I be able to create these health systems Well, I don't even understand what health systems are? So what do you want to see from <laughs> groups like Access Accelerated and the, and the pharmaceutical companies that are here and all the other stakeholders? So for me, I, I live in Kenya, by the way, and uh, I left Nairobi. Nairobi is the capital of Kenya. I went to the very last mile where there's nothing, absolutely nothing. And I, cr I made, it is very fortunate and very unfortunate that the place that I live, the village, we have a very huge endemic, uh, we have a 40% rate of sickle cell. So I, yeah, I found uh, the member, the, since healthcare is devolved in Kenya, so we have to do with the county governments. Dr. Kibacho, I don't know if he's still in here, he told me, yes, we can create the healthcare guidelines, but healthcare is devoid. What are you going to create in the ground? Those are the people you need to speak to. So I went there. I removed myself from Nairobi, the luxuries of being in a city to being in a village where there's no internet. Showed this, told this MC member, county assembly member, that we have 40%. This is where you live. These are the people who vote for you. These are the numbers on the ground. How can you be able to help me? So it's like, Leah, I will create an opportunity. The way you spoke to me, speak to these other people who create policies in this county. I spoke to them. They gave me budgetary allocation. Not me, the county allocator said, this girl, she's ever going to be a headache for us if we do not do something. So they gave us budgetary allocation to deal with sickle cell, to create help points of access, OK? Medication. We are working with another partner on the ground to provide capacity for doctors to understand what sickle cell is. So for me, this is one of the things that Access Accelerated can be able to be involved in, to be able to look at these things that we are doing as patients. Patients who have been able to, to empower health systems, to be able to create health systems for other patients. How can you give us capacity to do more? Okay. Because patients are, are brought here as tokens because we don't understand the language of policy. How can Access Accelerated and other partners be able to make us more fluent, to speak correctly, to speak rightfully, to speak as experts in our own rights, not only as patients, but people who understand that the budget you've put here is, is not, it does not make sense, or the policy does not translate on the ground. So it's, yeah. it's giving you a voice. And, Give and, us a voice. And yeah. Catherine, uh, presumably a lot of what Leah has been saying chimes with you. Um, you deal with diabetes and, uh, again, another uh, serious uh, and endemic condition in Kenya. Um, supply of medicines is, is a huge problem. What, what, in your opinion, are the problems of the health system facing people living with diabetes? Uh, for example, for children living with type 1 diabetes, um, the supply of insulin is a problem because of the cold chain. So issues of supply of certain types of medications. And even access, at what point 
are these uh, people living with these conditions able to access the medication? Because previously, NCDs were at higher level hospitals, not at primary healthcare facilities, which meant, of course, access was limited. If you have a child with type 1 diabetes somewhere in the village, in the past, they'd have to travel long distances to actually access these medications. Okay, we do have a program which has been running for the last, um, since 2012, changing um, diabetes in children. But this again is a pharma-driven project for a specific length of time, with the hope that over time, the government would take over the supply of insulin to children and to other people living with diabetes. But again, as Dr. Kibashi was saying, systems in government take time to uh, be implemented. And even if the project will continue with the supply of insulin, we'll still have to get to the point where this is something that the government, the county governments will have to take over in order for these children to get their life-saving insulin supplies. In addition to that, we're discussing this morning the challenges of adolescents and young adults who tend to fall through uh, the cracks. We do have pediatric clinics, we have adult clinics, but as the good pediatricians have said, you know, we can't treat um, children as, ad as small adults and also the adolescents. They don't have access. They go to adult clinics, for example, the type 1 diabetes. They move out of the pediatric clinic. They uh, transition into the adult clinic, but the adult clinic is not ready for them. So is there one approach or, or one partnership that would, in your opinion, make a big difference with that? I think if we... Um, partnership maybe looking at um, the adolescent young adult right age group which at the moment is not well catered for for example even with the program that we have with the type 1 of the children with type 1 diabetes they tend to be managed pretty well until they get up to about age 18 when they transition out of the program and then because they do not um, they're probably in university they no longer have um, either parental or financial support they probably don't have health insurance. They're not able to take care of their insulin supplies. And then again, with all the peer pressures that come with young adolescents and uh, young adults, they just seem to forget. So we really need, that is one age group where we really need um, focused programs in order to support them make that transition, okay. whether it's in diabetes or any other non-communicable disease condition. Okay, let me come to Dr. Edward because um, you're working with Farm Access Foundation, which is doing some amazing things regarding access to healthcare using mobile technology. Tell us about that. Okay, I think uh, for those who've been here since morning, I've heard a lot of facts. One of them is that the NCD pandemic is growing even in sub Saharan Africa. Uh, practice on the frontiers as a frontline primary healthcare worker for the last decade. And even there, you could tell that there are more people who are coming with this condition. I think my senior colleagues have been there for a little bit longer than me. And uh, one thing that we all notice that for a vast majority of the patients across a continuum of care, what we do deliver is suboptimal. And this is for various reasons. And as a result, if you were to take a cohort of patients in the West and in Sub-Saharan Africa, the mortality and uh, complications associated with the morbidities are higher in our case. So that is the bad news. The good news is that we are in the middle of a technological revolution. And uh, this small gadget in my hand provides us with an opportunity for those of us who are engaged. My goodness, that is small. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so it's a feature phone. And uh, the interesting thing is that Kenya is one country that is revolutionizing access to mobile. 94% mobile phone penetration rates. 66% of the people use this gadget, not just as a communication tool, but as a platform to conduct very many things. I don't know how many of you in the room have heard about M-Pesa. Yes. So we are the proud founders or inventors of mobile money. And what we think at farm access is, could we use this technological platform that has been able to solve the challenges around financial inclusion to also bring about inclusion and access to healthcare? 
Uh, what we found out is that over the last couple of years, uh, with support from uh, the Dutch Foreign Ministry, Pfizer Foundation, Gilead, and a few other partners engaged in the access uh, projects, that yes, digital tools are enablers towards access, and yes, digital tools do provide one critical thing that a lot of us forget about access programs. Somebody mentioned something about accountability. And I believe uh, systems in which you're working on uh, do provide an opportunity for transparency. Because it's one thing to provide the access, but if there's no opportunity for transparency, then it does create a shadow of doubt mm -hmm. towards sustaining the continuum of the care. And you've been working with private partners for a particular pilot project, yes. which helps towards financing yes. uh, healthcare, even in quite remote areas. So, yes. so as regards the project, I think uh, we're partnering with the Safaricom Foundation, our technical partner, Keape, uh, with a project that's called MTBA. So it's a revolutionary mobile-based digital health financial uh, platform. And in exactly two minutes, using the phone, you could have a low-cost health insurance, you could have a health savings scheme, but importantly, for donor-funded projects, a transparent way to track the way in which the care really is good. delivered. And uh, particularly for the project we're working on, I'd like to say that we have a collaboration in partnership with Sanofi, uh, targeted towards NCD cares, hypertension and diabetes in particular. And what we're trying to look at is, are we able to solve three key recurring challenges? The first one is that Sub-Saharan Africa has a big deficit of skilled healthcare human resource, and particularly for NCD care, this is even worse. The second one is that access to care is limited for many patients, and this access can be both geographical, access to education, knowledge and awareness, and finally, financial access. So the partnership with Sanofi tries to address all of this uh, through uh, this mobile platform and MTBA, and one thing that we're trying to say is that with use of these digital health solutions, we are able to improve on adherence. And the adherence means that uh, patients have better quality care. They have fewer associated uh, mortalities and also complications from morbidities are low. Secondly, it does act as a financial inclusion tool in that we say this patient is benefiting from the accelerated project and you could directly be able to follow the individual patient and know that they did receive the care that they received because it's all patient driven. Right. Yeah. So that's one of the things it's that we are. It's a really doing. impressive way uh, of using mobile technology, particularly for someone who just uses her phone for paying games on. So that, that is <laughs> amazing. Um, let's have some questions from the floor. Does anyone want to put uh, any questions about uh, what we've heard, people living with NCDs and mobile technology in Kenya? Uh, lady in the uh, middle row there. Thank you. There's a microphone coming. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address is Leah. Hi. Um, thank you, first of all. Um, I'm an also a person living in NCD. I have endometriosis, so I'm here as an endometriosis advocate. But I'm also involved in public health research in um, Barbados, I'm from the Caribbean. And so in the previous session, um, Katie from NCD Alliance suggested that um, instead of tokenism, we leveraged our live experiences to help others. And so that's what I'm doing. And so for those of you who don't know, endometriosis is a condition that only affects women. It takes seven to 10 years for diagnosis. Um, it's been known since 1860. However, only 20% of people worldwide are aware of this condition. It's crippling. Mm. It affects all aspects of our lives. And so looking at um, CH, um, is, um, sorry, comprehensive universal health care and return on investments from the previous sessions, as it pertains to medicines and technologies with endo and other similar pelvic health conditions, which impact close to 200 million women worldwide, what do you suggest that we do to bring this to a higher platform? Thank you. Yeah, and it would seem to me that you know, research uh, and new treatments is the perfect place to get 
other partners involved, particularly the, the, the private sector and the, the pharmaceutical companies. Um, does someone want to, uh, to take that question? Um, what, what, what you have said when you when you've stood up and, and just said I'm an endometriosis advocate is is very powerful because a lot of people were uh, on, from my my observation surprised because you came out because endometriosis in different parts of the world is also something that we do not speak about in open platforms like this and yes a lot of women do suffer in silence because of this situation but uh, for us and uh, having this platform of the unga happening and the ncds it is to make diseases like for example sickle cell is one of those diseases that has never been talked about in such a high level platform like this how can you be able to leverage other voices or other platforms to be able to increase the awareness of endometriosis to not only awareness because awareness creates demand and how what would you do with demand if you don't have health systems to to absorb that so you need to leverage yourself and align yourself with partners and other people having the same conversations as you to be able to elevate it like i secretly trojan host sickle cell into the NCD alliance, into the NCDs of Kenya. So people, when they remember NCDs, diabetes, cancer, the 4 by 4 they also mention, oh, by the way, since Leah is there, let me mention sickle cell. <laughs> OK? So that, in my opinion, that is how I did it. So it is, it is a, an uphill task, and it's, it's very difficult. And But this is the first. You being here is a, is a, is a great Absolutely. Okay. The fact that you stood up and yeah. talked about it, and to be honest, as Leah said, you know, she was the girl who made herself a headache <laughs> for the, that's, uh, you know, women, and we're very good at that, so, yeah. and the more we talk about it, right, the more that it gets onto people's agendas. Um, sorry, did someone over there have a hand up? Ah, oh, I see, I'm seeing things. Okay, gentlemen at the back. Uh, thank you so much. Um, for, for your awesome words. I have a question on the mobile technology and its use. Um, you mentioned Sanofi, and you have these larger financial partners that are able to develop these awesome technologies. My question is, do you see a problem with um, maybe smaller companies or startups that are trying to also address these issues but have problems because perhaps um, there is no financial model to scale? Um, so I was wondering if you could talk on maybe sort of the, the growing sort of startup industry, maybe even local or internationally, uh, to address the same issues uh, using mobile technology? Uh, I think uh, your question is uh, pertinent, and uh, perhaps as a slightly larger organization, we do have uh, the benefit of uh, catching the eye of uh, people that you could partner with. But that said, uh, what I do believe is that currently in the tech ecosystem, if you do have a good product, then leveraging on these to develop partnerships is crucial. And just to give a little bit more insight onto our partnership with the Sanofi, uh, it's really about the access component of the development and gaining useful insights from uh, the patients who will benefit from this collaboration so that we could derive uh, care analytics to improve the care that we deliver. Because it's one thing to have an access project, it's another thing to have the patient's adherence to the medication and finally it's more important to gain intelligence behind the entire project so that it could inform future projects but also see how these learnings could be incorporated to scale up efforts you've heard from kenya that we are the first people to sign the document of commitment to the ncd and we hope that we'll be able to incorporate this into the universal health coverage because uh, Fortunately, the co-chair of UHC also happens to be from Kenya, so we hope we could lead, <laughs> we could lead from the front. Thank you. All right, guys, we are coming to the end of it. Can I, uh, very quick question, last question to you, Eva. Um, we've got the high-level meeting coming up. Um, it, it's going to look at global progress, national progress, local progress. What are you hoping will come out of that? Luckily for, for Kenya, actually, we have our head of state here, and uh, we have our uh, uh, Minister of Health here. So we really, and the reason why we are here as a civil society 
is to listen to every word that they will say. And we will follow them to their door to make sure they accomplish whatever it is that they promise. We've been uh, talking a lot about uh, the call to action, and we do have, and Dr. Kebashu is here, is uh, our head, and he, he goes with us wherever we go, because we really, we, he is really the voice of NCD in the, in the government, and the passionate about it. After forming, uh, uh, launching a, an NCD strategy in Kenya, and even an ICC, that's an intersectoral co uh, committee, to make sure that that strategy is realized. We want to make sure that as the president talks about his big four, be one, the fourth one being the universal health coverage or health, we're going to hold him responsible. So whatever it is that comes, we want to see that with the mainstream and they prioritize NCDs in the health budget. We've been talking a lot. and. When we started the uh, division of uh, NCDs in Kenya, before even Kibashio came, they had so they just had a desk. We used to go for meetings there. They, they, the budget allocation for the whole year would not even take care of, of the tea that they served the people who, the partners who came for meetings. So now things have changed. And that goodwill that they have, we are going to make, uh, take advantage of it. The reason why we are, uh, uh, we are here and we thank God for Access Accelerated. Access Accelerated is one of the partners that we really must, when they came to Kenya uh, last, last this March. year, this year, mm -hmm. this year, James and Mara and uh, we had Justin, we had a meeting and I told them, I'm just hoping this is not the one of the farmer mix, just appear in the country, talk, up, talk big and disappear. And I always, and they know I'm very, um, the, the, I'm usually very forward when I talk about these things. And they promised this, the dialogue will continue. I must say I'm not very disappointed because we are here today talking about turning the words you gave us in March into action. And I think this is what we are as a civil society. As we empower people living with NCDs to go out there like what the HIV people did and make the government listen. We have the, our groups of people living with NCDs who are made of 15 different conditions. They just registered an organization, which is, I'm telling, is going to turn heads in Kenya. Because even as uh, Ometa is talking about mobile, for use, uh, use of mobile pe uh, money, our groups, especially the Kenya Defeat Diabetes, they have penetrated 27 out of 47 counties as we speak. Right. They use the mobiles, they have a chat group. I can tell you, you farmer, you're in trouble. You sell a substandard group uh, drug or it has a side effect. It is passed overnight through that WhatsApp group. A uh, uh, person with diabetes will tell others, do not go and buy metformin from a certain farmer because it's giving you this one, two, three. And believe you me, they've, they've been uh, supported by World Diabetes Foundation to come up with their own guidelines of managing their diabetes. We give them education through Kenya Diabetes, the, the, uh, the DMI. We have trained them to, to learn about the side effects. So these are the, the empowerment we are talking about. We want the government, as they make the resolution today, to support people living with NCDs. Look at the advocacy agenda document that was the, uh, um, uh, established or was, was published by the people living with NCDs. And also, we got it into a, a, a Swahili dialect. We know Kenyans. We are supposed to be speaking Swahili, all of us. I must confess, I'm not good in that language, but it is still our national language. So we have that uh, patient's advocacy agenda translated in Swahili, so it will have a reach of so many people in the country. So I think what we can ask, and uh, you're asking me what I want to, uh, uh, the government to come out with. I'm saying what I want to come out with from here is that I think the government should know uh, civil society of uh, the NCDs from Kenya is here, and we are listening, and we will hold them accountable to everything they say. And for the people living with NCDs, we will work with them. They will tell us what they, we want. And through people like Access Accelerated, Global NCD Alliance, I'm sure Christina might be here or, or her members. What we are doing is let's support the people living with NCDs. Let's walk the talk okay. and let's be there for them. And I think if we do that, we will see all these NCD menace and uh, we talk about the burden. 
uh, early in the morning we were told the bad the NCDs are not communicable. That's why they call them non communicable. But the burden of NCDs is communicable. It affects the whole family. Right. So we need to change that. I, I think just listening to the passion of, of the panelists, it's clear that things have changed, things are moving on, but there's clearly uh, a way to go. And that is what we're hoping will come out of the, the high level meeting. Um, we are going to have to leave it there. I mean, I, it's been a great discussion. Please stay where you are. Um, a big thank you, please, to, to my panelists. Thank you, guys. Stay where you are because I'm going to give the last word to the director of Access uh, Accelerated. He's worked tirelessly to bring all the partners together to get the initiative going and to build on the successes. And, it, you know, he's never wanted to rest on his laurels. Uh, please welcome James Fitzer. Thank you, Shirley. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Eva, for those very kind words. Um, I promise that I'll be brief because looking at the time and looking at the evening and that I'm the only one standing in between of all of us in the reception. Um, but I think that we've had a very rich discussion tonight and that we've heard many different perspectives and much expertise. And I'd like to say thank you very much to this panel for coming all the way to share your experience and your perspectives with us and also to the last panel and all of the high level uh, participants. Um, I think we're learning, and I think that this is exactly the goal and the vision of Access Accelerated. We want to bring different stakeholders together to see how collaboratively and together we can take meaningful steps to address the challenges that are posed by NCDs. But what I have heard is that while this is a very good start, we have a lot of work to do. But I'm confident that together we can actually do that. And I look forward to the next steps, how we really together can move from these words into action. So with that, before we move to the reception, I would like to take the opportunity to thank everyone who have, who's traveled so far um, to work with us and to be here tonight. Your Royal Highness, thank you. Your Excellency, thank you. Uh, Dr. Nishta, thank you for coming and joining us. Um, to all of our panelists um, up here in the previous panel and our fantastic moderator, thank you. Um, I'd like to pause for just one moment and say thank you to our Access Accelerated members who have made this possible, to all of our partners, but to also thank the Access Accelerated team who has worked so hard over the past several months with all of our uh, colleagues to make this possible as well. So thank you very much and I look forward to moving together um, on the next steps. So with that, I'd like to invite you all to uh, a cocktail reception. Thank you. Thank you.